It's uh, good to, to see a filled room. Last time I was here, I was watching a movie. It was a movie about uh, a couple who were, were married for 45 years and breaking up. So it's not, not very nice, but uh, it's good to be on the other side. Uh, I'll be married for 30 years next year, I think. So I surely hope it won't happen to me. Uh, anyway. Um, this talk is about building a scalable and secure Python REST backend, or rather building a number of Python scalable REST backends. Uh, first I'll do a short introduction. Uh, my name is Gerard Lutterop. I've been a developer since 1977. Uh, back in the 70s, developer wasn't, a, uh, wasn't an official name. I started developing on my Texas Instruments 57 which had like 50 programming steps. had a lot of fun with it. Um, in 2002, I chose to develop only in Python. Back then it was 2.2. Uh, and uh, much to my uh, joy, uh, this is a literal uh, quote, Python is the fastest growing major programming language today, which was in 2019. So uh, choosing Python really paid off. Uh, I've been uh, using Python for a lot of subjects, uh, for data science, when data science wasn't yet data science, for marketing, uh, to build software robots, uh, websites, etc., etc., uh, for anything except a UI, basically. Um, we needed some rest. Uh, a few years back, uh, our cash cow was Android 1.0. Android, uh, which sounds a lot like Android, uh, the, the, the name comes from the uh, input uh, Android, input Droid. They were software robots for a major telco in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, we did process automation for a number of processes for uh, this company. Um, uh, we ran into some limitations of the current solution, so we decided to build a new solution, Android 2.0. And uh, we had a very ambitious goal, or I had a very ambitious goal. And it was to uh, base it on automatic process execution based on BPMN. BPMN stands for Business Process Model and Notation. And our goal was to build an automatic execution tool uh, in order to scale the Android, uh, the Android service. Uh, in order to uh, fulfill that task, we had some uh, more than 100 separate endpoints uh, with a, a rather complex inheritance scheme uh, to build. Uh, so, uh, as I viewed it, the only ch chance we had to build something like that is to use microservices. Microservices were rather new at the time, uh, so we had to uh, choose how to implement those microservices. Uh, for uh, the few of you who uh, possibly don't know REST, uh, question, uh, who, are you, who of you are familiar with REST? Can I see some? Okay, so uh, nearly everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this very briefly. Um, uh, most is about the five HTTP verbs, get, post, put, patch, and delete. When you implement them, you have a, a more or less complete REST implementation. Uh, for the rest, it's all the advantages of using REST. I won't go into them uh, because you probably all know them. Um, at that time, uh, building a microservices solution uh, with a REST uh, approach, uh, I couldn't find a good existing solution. Uh, what I definitely wanted was a database-independent solution. I have a strong preference for Postgres. I think uh, many of you uh, know Postgres and like Postgres. Uh, to me, it's a, it's a virtually no management database uh, with a nice mix between relational and uh, document-oriented. I also didn't want to uh, tie myself to a web framework. So I definitely wanted a uh, web framework independent solution. 
Uh, we had been using Pyramid uh, until then, and I uh, grew a strong dislike of Pyramid because it's uh, very complex, and it has hooks on hooks on hooks on handles, and you uh, lose track very easily. Also dislike Django, uh, so Django for us uh, wa wasn't a solution. And at that time, Flask wasn't as popular or as strong as it is at the moment. Uh, we eventually switched to Flask, but at that moment uh, there wasn't one single best framework for Python. Uh, we also, I also wanted a Python independent interface specification. Uh, there was a web framework or a REST framework for Python, uh, which was based on Python uh, types for specification of the interface, and uh, I didn't want to use Python for specifying the interface because REST is not about Python, REST is about a number of abstract interfaces, uh, so I don't want to tie them to Python-specific interfaces. I also dislike SQL Alchemy. Uh, it's, it's, I sound a bit like the, the mopper smurf. Uh, it's all about all the things I don't like, uh, but SQL, SQL Alchemy, to me, it's too magic. Uh, it's, it's very programmer-oriented, which I like, um, I know many programmers don't like databases, don't like uh, SQL schemes, etc. Uh, so SQL Alchemy tries to solve that problem, uh, but I think, my experience, that in solving that problem, uh, they threw away the child with the bathwater. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the magic and the, the connection between the front end and the implementation and database, to me, it's too vague. I want to have influence on how the database is organized. And the uh, last um, uh, thing about existing solutions, security is hard to get right. Uh, like uh, Pyramid, uh, they have a nice plugin for uh, security, but getting it right is really hard. So let's build our own. Um, of course, it's very uh, risky to build an ambitious framework like this with all the uh, with all the restrictions I put on it. Uh, I have some more restrictions, some more criteria. I wa I'm a developer myself, so I want to have a framework which is developer oriented, with uh, ideally no boilerplate code. Uh, one of the reasons I dislike uh, Java is uh, that it's got a lot of boilerplate code, don't like that. Um, I also want, want it to be easily expandable. Uh, my experience in uh, expanding existing solutions is uh, it will almost always fail on expanding the existing database, adding fields, tables, relations to an existing database in production uh, almost always turns out to be very, very difficult. Uh, because you have to uh, expand uh, an existing database with possibly millions or tens of millions of rows. And uh, the, the last three, database, web framework, and definition agnostic, I already mentioned them. Uh, we had to make a lot of design choices. I wanted to adhere to REST as much as possible. Uh, uh, to me, REST was the best concrete choice for implementing microservices. But REST has a lot of interpretations, <laughs> so we had to choose one. And instead of uh, cherry-picking uh, the best solution for REST, uh, we uh, chose um, the, the like 40-page um, explanation of Todd Frederick about REST, and we adhere to that as much as possible. Uh, even then, there are many open choices, so we chose as wisely as we could, I hope. Then um, we go more into uh, how the solution was defined. And don't worry, we'll, have, we'll also have some code somewhere down the line. Uh, one of the decisions we made was to map a URL to code. Like in Flask, you can, with a decorator, you can specify the uh, routing from uh, URL to your specific class or method. And uh, we decided to uh, have a fixed mapping. 
because at that time we were building this BPMN execution engine and uh, after uh, long deliberation and discussion uh, we came up with a four level URL specification with uh, f the, the four levels we uh, came up with what was the first is the tenant which in uh, this example is the uh, subdomain of the main domain uh, then we have each tenant can have several projects each pro project can have several domains and each domain can have several resources and the, the resource finally is the endpoint for the for the URL for identifying individual items uh, we decided to use UUIDs because UUIDs are by definition unique or uh, virtually uh, unique and you can always specify a unique item by ID, of course, uh, independent of tenants or whatever. Uh, we also use an optional tag for easy URLs. Instead of having this uh, slash person, person slash uh, for a, b, c, dash, etc., we can have person slash first name slash last name, for instance. Uh, last thing we uh, wanted to have was standard querying uh, possibilities, easy, simple querying, like uh, having a list of all items uh, which are uh, before the 1st of May 2019. It, it can be specified like in the example on the lower line. Um, ah, we, uh, we, we had even more design choices. Uh, the data structure should be Python data type independent. Of course, there's a mapping between the data types, uh, the, the specification data types and the Python data types. Uh, at that time, there were uh, like three major choices for uh, schema definition. Uh, also, at that time, there wasn't a clear winner uh, based on uh, completeness and ease of specification and brevity, we chose uh, RAML, RAML, uh, <coughs> which turned out to be a good choice, uh, but it was uh, very important to me to be uh, definition independent, so we could change that to uh, API Blueprint, for example, or to add API Blueprint. Um, as I said, most programmers, including myself, don't like databases, uh, so I wanted to, to have a single uh, model for the database and not change it ever again. So I want to have a fixed scheme and adding endpoints uh, should not result in uh, changing the database. So we have, uh, like uh, I realized later, uh, that we made a, uh, um, uh, how do you say it, uh, a more document-oriented database in a SQL database. We have three main uh, tables. We have the items table, uh, which are in one single table. Uh, they are ad identified by a UUID. And their columns have names like int11, string7, uh, json3. Uh, and in a separate uh, resource, we do the mapping between their actual attribute names and uh, their technical attribute names. Then we have a separa separate relations table where we can have uh, the one-on-one, -on -one, one on N or N to M relations between uh, separate items, uh, which has the advantage, since all items are in one single table, that items don't have a specific types. Items are always of type item. So you can have uh, any relation between any type of item because we have the relations table separate. And, uh, of course, an item has a type, it has a mapping, and in the mapping there is the translation between the attribute name of the item and their technical name. So, for instance, a, a silly attribute like age will uh, translate to int 11 and back. Um, we found out quite uh, soon that we, need, we needed some kind of uh, asynchronous execution. Uh, when you have a, a long execution flow, you can't do it synchronously 
because when, uh, for instance, it, it would take uh, two days for the execution to, uh, to com uh, complete, you simply can't do it uh, synchronously. So we uh, uh, quickly found out we needed some kind of async execution. And I think this is the core of what we've done, uh, is the code mapping between the URL and uh, the code. Um, we have a fixed system there where we use the, the four levels from, from tenant to resource, which translates uh, to a class. We uh, Don't worry, you will see an example of that in, uh, in a uh, number of slides from now. And uh, the, the standard code that we built is that a standard uh, plugin, as we call it, the standard behavior is that it writes to the database and it gets items from a database uh, so you can build an endpoint with a definition only, with only the mapping, and then the framework uh, will uh, give you a uh, ge generic endpoint without any specific behavior. We, we will see an example of that. When you need a specific behavior, you simply override the standard methods uh, to do that uh, custom behavior. Uh, final thing, which turned out to be really hard to get right, uh, is to get a security right. Um, we uh, tried to uh, build, or uh, we, we tried to uh, buy or get a, a standard solution. It turned out uh, not to be available at that moment. So we built our own, which is token-based. Initially, we only uh, w used uh, JSON web tokens, which is a distributed system. And uh, later we added a stored token uh, system, uh, which gives the option of retrieving uh, tokens. Um, this is the overview of the whole system as it is at the moment. Uh, at uh, the bottom left you see the entrance from the internet, a, an optional cache, a reverse proxy before it uh, goes to a web framework. Don't worry, next uh, slide will show all the choices we made. Uh, then it enters the framework. We don't have a name for a framework yet. We keep calling it the framework. Uh, the framework uh, has a connection with a message queue and a number of plugins. Uh, we use the plugins to uh, build custom behavior for uh, each endpoint as requested. Of course, there's a connection with the database and uh, we uh, have the option of storing files in a blob system. These are the concrete choices we made. At this moment, we use uh, the Google uh, Content Delivery Network uh, for edge site uh, caching. We use Nginx, as most of you will uh, probably use as a reverse proxy. Uh, we use Flask as our web framework. And um, then we go to the, the Python-based framework. We use Python only in, uh, in our framework. And uh, to give you an impression of uh, the, the amount of Flask we use, the, the Flask plugin we built to connect to our framework con uh, contains roughly 200 lines of code. And uh, initially we tried to use Tornado, uh, we ran, ran into some limitations, and uh, in like two days we were able to use Flask uh, full swing in our fr uh, framework. So uh, that gives an impression of how independent of the choices uh, we are. Um, for storage, we use Postgres because I like that uh, the best. We use Google Buckets for blobs at the moment, but we're independent uh, there also. We use GitHub, uh, obviously, for uh, the plugins, uh, but we, also we have also used our own system for storing plugins. So we had like a meta system for building our own system. And uh, we use uh, RabbitMQ for our message queue, which is a very nice scalable solution. Then, finally, some examples. Uh, this example is a simple playground without any code. This is our uh, internal tutorial um, how to build some endpoints. Uh, this, is a, uh, this, is, this is an education uh, example where we have uh, two types of person, uh, a teacher and a student. We have classes and we have courses. And uh, in, in this simple example, we also use inheritance. We have this type person, which is of type object. This, this is actual uh, 
uh, RAML as we use and as you can import in our uh, system. Uh, this person uh, type has uh, three properties. The property name, which is a required property, and a birth date. Uh, they have two different uh, types. Name, is obviously, is a string type. Birth date is a date type. Date is a type which is uh, available in, in RAML, uh, which, uh, of course, translates quite easily to the date time uh, type in Python. Tag is also a string. Uh, next page, uh, which is a bit more uh, uh, dense, we see the two types, teacher and student, uh, which inherit from the type person, uh, which add some extra properties. We have the types class and course, which are their own standalone types. And uh, at the end of course, you see uh, the property max participants, uh, which specifies, uh, the, of course, the uh, maximum number of participants for that course uh, with a default number of 30. At the end, you see the five endpoints uh, which are uh, defined for uh, these uh, types, uh, slash persons, teachers, students, classes, and courses. Uh, this in itself, as we, uh, when we uh, import this in our framework and we deploy it, uh, it takes roughly 30 seconds to, to build all the uh, database tables uh, or expand the database tables, etc. Uh, but after like 30 seconds or less, you have a fully functional, uh, scalable live service. Uh, so anyone can take this RAML and build his own plain vanilla endpoint. Uh, then, uh, I, I don't have an example of this, uh, so you have to take my word for it. We can populate this, uh, these endpoints. I have given two, uh, two examples. Uh, I have a, a student and a teacher, John Doe as a student and Jane Doe as a teacher. They both have a, a birth date. We've posted them to uh, the endpoints. We can uh, use anything for that, uh, some Python script or curl or Postman or whatever. And then uh, when we have populated the, uh, the endpoints, we can do some querying. So uh, the, the last one, which actually works, is um, give us all the students with a birth date uh, after the 1st of January 2000. Uh, and the next one is give us all the teachers with a birth date before 1999, uh, between 1999 and 1970, uh, whose faculty uh, starts with uh, GEO. Uh, these queries actually work uh, after just uh, deploying uh, the RAML. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll speed it up a bit. Uh, of course, no code, no fun. Um, we wanted to have a standard system uh, where you can, uh, on predefined points, enter your own code. After long discussions, we came up with what we call internally a V. Uh, we have three steps before uh, a step is really executed. We can do three things in that. We can transform data, we can validate the data, and we can uh, do some uh, additional security on the data. Then we execute it, and uh, in the way back, we perform uh, the same steps, but on the either uh, return data or filtered data or whatever. And finally, some code. Uh, this is actual code from the, from the person class that we saw in the RAML specification. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an age a static method which, based on uh, the default date of today and the birth date, uh, returns the age. And uh, the se second one is quite interesting, validate before insert. Um, you see uh, on the top one, the class person inherits from the plugin class, which is a framework class. Um, the moment you specify uh, validate before insert and you specify birth date, the framework will uh, populate birth date with the specific birth date of this endpoint, so it will give you the birth date uh, in the type that you specified, which is date. So you, do, you don't have to think about that ever again. The only thing you have to do, uh, again, this is actual code, and as I said, I don't like boilerplate code. This is actual code, so there uh, you can specify if the age is below 18, uh, you raise uh, the invalid input execution uh, exception 
which is handled by the framework and uh, which returns a uh, HTTP status code 422. So you don't have to worry about that uh, also. And uh, the last one uh, will uh, add the age to uh, any resource. Uh, you don't have to calculate that yourself. Age uh, is deceptively simple, but as you can see in the age function, you have to compare, compare the years and you have to check whether uh, someone's birth, uh, someone's anniversary has passed or not. Uh, so it's, uh, it sounds trivial, but it's not as simple as that. And in the transform after get, it receives uh, uh, an item of type person and it can add the age property uh, based on the birth date. Um, I'll speed it up even further. Uh, this is very nice and it's a nice conceptual framework and it actually works, but will it perform? And uh, so we, we did a very simple benchmark. We uh, put all of our components on one very simple machine, which we call internally a matchbox because it was a very small uh, one CPU, one gigabyte machine. Uh, no optimization, whatever. And we hammered it and uh, we easily achieved 100 inserts per second. Uh, so uh, the number of reads would be uh, much higher because for the inserts, uh, the database would have to do uh, some actual work. So we didn't worry about performance ever again. We built some applications because code is nice, but we have to build something with it. Uh, we built this BPMN execution engine. We were roughly 80% done. And we, we built this system as a, a functions as a systems service which was actually done. Um, we also built uh, okapifordevelopers.com, uh, which is uh, like an aggregate of uh, s uh, existing API functions. It's like Rapid API, but better. Believe me, lots, lots and lots better. Uh, for those of you, uh, of you who don't know Rapid API, just look them up. And the last thing we developed is uh, Sidekick, uh, which is an assistant for uh, website owners. But, four things, it's quite a lot. This one, uh, well we stopped because uh, it turned out to be very hard to get some traction on that. Um, to get the summary, uh, next two ones also. And the last one, Sidekick, we finally have some traction, uh, some business traction for that. Um, in the future, uh, we definitely want to uh, keep using our framework. Um, the, the Okapi uh, idea should be viable. There are a number of uh, projects doing that now. KPN recently opened their API store. Uh, and uh, our Okapi for developers is essentially an API store. And we haven't open sourced it yet, but if you're interested in getting it open source, uh, drop us an email and we'll uh, get in touch, see how many uh, people are interested in using this. Any questions, any remarks, uh, I'll state my name again. Uh, my contact details are there, so if you want to get in touch, please do. Thank you, Gerard. On the bombshell of let's get it open source, let's uh, thank uh, Gerard for his uh, talk. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two questions. Question in the back, do you see a question? I have a question, but I didn't want to stop your opportunity. Ah, sorry. So the question is about how to migrate or evolve the schemes. Yep. That's uh, that, that's uh, that's the um, uh, uh, a, a big uh, how do you call it trap for for projects when they move on uh, they have to change their scheme. Uh, we have solved that by um, uh, supporting evolving schemes. So when attributes are added, they are automatically added to the endpoint. They are auto automatically added to the database. When attributes are dropped. Uh, they are automatically uh, deprecated from the database. Uh, so initially we had a, an, an extra level, level 5, which was version. But after long discussion we dropped ver version. 
and uh, at this moment we have never had the need to uh, deprecate an API completely. We always could keep moving on, adding attributes, changing attributes, and dropping attributes. Thank you. One more question. Hi. Uh, did you try any other uh, message queue applications except for RabbitMQ? And can you tell something about your experience with Rabbit? Yes. Uh, we, uh, I looked at the, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, serviced uh, solutions. So I looked at the, the Amazon uh, MQ offering. And um, honestly, it was, uh, it was a, a bit of a laugh because they didn't support pushing. Uh, they couldn't guarantee a uh, single delivery of messages. So yes, we looked at, uh, I, I looked at uh, Amazon. Um, and our experience with the RabbitMQ is when your number of workers is enough, RabbitMQ is synchronous. It, uh, it has zero delay and uh, it buffers your messages quite nicely and uh, w for instance when you have two little workers and uh, it will handle your load perfectly so we're very very content with the rabbit mq okay so for further questions there's room in between talks to discuss whatever you learned here today uh, a final hand of applause for gerard and